A pattern I notice all the time in the art community is a great mastery of the basics of watercolor painting, but then there's something missing in the art that makes it look flat or just a little bit off. Fix that and your paintings will improve quickly no matter what your style is and even the medium that you use. And that's why I'm gonna share what I do to consistently paint watercolors that grab attention because this is like riding a bike. Once you learn it, it's yours. Hi, I'm Françoise, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Let's get into this with a clownfish painting from a reference that I found on Pixabay. To master watercolor painting, you already know that you're gonna need a wide set of skills like some sketching, composition, color mixing, water control, using all the right techniques, also the right supplies. And for a beginner, it's just a normal thing to focus on those things at first. But then comes the time when many of us get past that beginner stage. We get more comfortable with painting, but somehow we're still feeling stuck. And if that's you, that could be that you notice that your work looks flat, boring, or unrealistic, and you're not sure what to do to fix it. And in other cases, you've unlocked the next level where your art looks more confident and more professional, but you notice it is not consistent because sometimes it turns out great and sometimes it's a bit off. In both cases, I think that is because the basic skills are just the tip of the iceberg and a lot of us miss the bigger picture when we learn art. And what I'm gonna share today is something that I'm still working on actively as a more advanced painter. So it's really a work in progress. So what I mean is that basic skills will get you to feel comfortable with watercolor painting, but they are not enough to guarantee that you're able to paint what you envision every single time. And this video comes from the fact that I'm often told that I seem to be able to paint any subject in any medium. And thinking about this, I noticed that it's really coming from one thing, which is observation, because that helps me decide exactly what to focus on and how to translate this through painting. I paint realistically, but I notice that what I'm going to show you can also be found in loose watercolor paintings that look compelling. That's why I think it's so important. The first thing that you want to observe really closely is how color builds up contrast in a reference photo. And if you can do that, this is really gonna help you make sure that your paintings don't look flat and that they look more pro. You've probably heard of the light, mid, and dark tones. And this is way more important than the actual colors that you choose. And that's why when I teach, I'll tell you that you can use other colors than the ones that I chose. Because when you think about it, we can pick any reference photo and change all the colors and still get great results. And that to me is proof that contrast is built through something else than just color. But the first step still is to pick some colors, preferably as few as possible. First to remove overwhelm from having too many, but also to guarantee a good color harmony to your painting. That's why here, first I look at what I see in the reference at first glance. So here I see purple, green, orange, and a grayish brown color. So what I used to do as a beginner was to buy all the colors and just pick whatever color looked like what was in my reference. But if you're more comfortable with color mixing, it's gonna be more effective to work from a limited palette. And there are several ways to do this. For example here, I'm noticing hints of orange, yellow in the fish and hints of blue in the purple parts. So I'm thinking that I might as well just stick to the primaries to recreate all the colors. Yellow and red make orange, blue and red make purple, etc. So that's always the most simple way to build a simple palette and still paint any color you see in a photo when you pick the primaries. But sometimes it's boring to just paint with the primaries, we want to play around with other colors that we have. So when that happens, I look for anything that is close enough to the primaries, just a little bit more fun to use for a change, like this lemon yellow and more fancy colors like this Mayan orange, Cinereous blue, imperial purple, and graphite gray. And what's nice is that blue or purple mixed to orange or yellow tend to turn into a muddy mix, which could work for these dark areas at first glance. So I never worry about the dark parts when I choose my initial colors, since I know that we can easily create mud with a limited palette. Now I know what I want to use. Remember, colors are not the most important thing. I'm going to focus on tone. And guess what? This is going to be easy to do now and extremely efficient for a painting 
because the palette is so limited in the first place. And planning for light, mid, and dark tones in the painting is one of the things that many people tend to forget about. And so if you're having trouble leveling up watercolor, you might want to focus on that if you're not doing it already. Because having a variety of tones in a painting is what is going to make it more compelling and in my specific style, more realistic too. And just like you can pick a bunch of different color schemes for one painting, there's not just one way to create various tones, there are several. For example, we can play with water to make a tone lighter or darker. So let's take the color red and imagine we're going to paint in monochrome, just to show you my point. So let's say that the original color here is our mid-tone and I find it easier to do it that way when the color isn't especially light or dark. And to get a lighter tone from there, all we're going to need to do is add water. And to make it appear darker, all we'll need to do is to increase the amount of paint this time, less water. So now the paint is going to be thicker and look more opaque and that is what is going to make it look darker. That is the simplest way to build light, mid, and dark tones, especially for beginners who don't want the overwhelm of playing with color mixes. But then you might not always want to do monochrome paintings, so another easy way to do this is to just go for colors that naturally contrast with each other. And I'll go with an earthy theme for this example. For instance, I could pick this light Naples yellow for a light tone because it is so soft. This green as a mid-tone because to me it appears a bit stronger than my light yellow. And then I could pick indigo as a dark tone because it's dark blue and it seems to overpower the mid-tone green very much. And by mixing these colors to each other, you can actually see that we're able to get a bunch of other colors that link each main color to each other without overcomplicating the palette. So with just three colors, you're getting a bunch of other ones and you're getting also light, mid, and dark tones. A third and more advanced way that I love to use is to take white into consideration and also leverage color mixing to achieve that. For example, I already see white in the reference, in the fish, so I'll just consider that the paper is going to be the light tone right there. And remember, we can use white gouache or white watercolor for this, it doesn't have to be paper, but the white from the paper is always going to look more dramatic than anything else. My midtones will be the colors that I picked for this painting, minus the graphite gray that I prefer to keep for the darker parts. So after wetting the paper, I apply the brightest colors first, and lemon yellow and scenarius blue in particular really help add life to the painting because they're so bright. And I chose those bright colors because graphite gray has the potential to dull the painting later because of all the dark parts in the background, so I thought I'd need these to balance that effect. We can still add more water to these colors in places if we want them to turn into even lighter tones and make the transition smoother between strong paper white parts and painted parts. The more variety you can create, the better, and subtle color transitions also help for realism if that is your style, while strong contrasted paintings could look a bit more stylized. I start adding purple everywhere else, even to the dark parts, because I don't want to only use graphite gray for these. I want to make sure that it's mixed up to my other colors, otherwise it could look very heavy and disconnected from everything else. You can see I also create green by mixing yellow and blue right on the paper. So when you're comfortable with color mixing, that's one of those smart choices that you could plan for in advance. You get more colors in a painting from a limited palette. This first layer is way too light as you can see and since the paper dries after a while, I like to speed up that drying process, wet the sheet again and paint another layer. That's usually when I'll start including my dark tone. Here it's graphite gray. But that doesn't mean that I can't keep adding my mid-tones for more vibrancy of color and also even more tones created because watercolor is transparent when it's not thick. So the second layer overlaps on some of the first layer here and that will either intensify some parts or make other ones darker depending on the colors that I use. Now I'm ready to add more of that graphite gray color and when I think it's too dull, 
I can still overlap more purple onto it while it's still wet. And I rarely do a third layer, but that's something that you can consider if you haven't managed to get the result that you want from the first two, especially if your paper is a good one. Here, for example, I'm using the Arche 100% cotton watercolor paper, it's cold press, and I know it can bear many layers. And now a cool way to add contrast to this background for this specific painting is to splatter some water on the drying paint. And not only does that help with the underwater effect, but notice how it also makes the dark parts look a little bit more fun. And since we're getting some of the white paper back by doing this, I know that it will help tie this background together with the fish even more. In other realistic paintings where splatters will look strange, like a sky for instance, I would consider leaving paper white parts when I do the background. So now you know how I study color in a reference photo, how I pick a convenient theme, and how I build up contrast. And now with the fish, I would like to show you something else that is key to mastering watercolor beyond the basics. So far, if that makes sense to you, but you know that you would need some guidance in real time to really understand this, you'll find this fish painting on my Patreon, as well as a bunch of other tutorials that follow the same principle with contrast and tones, and I'll link that in the description of this video. To nail contrast and make it work for you, you also need to pay attention to something called edges. And again, observation here is key. And to simplify the term, I'd say that edges have to do with the way that you get from one color to another in a painting. Because there are four types of edges and each one produces a different effect. That's why they're so important. Especially for those of us who enjoy realism but still want the loose aspects of watercolor in their paintings. But again, look closely at what your favorite watercolor artists are doing and you'll notice that they use some or all of them to create interesting effects. The first type of edge is a hard edge. It's when two areas are distinct from each other and with watercolor, this is really easy to achieve on dry paper especially, that's what I'm doing now, because the paint retains the shape that we give it with our strokes. And here, I'm outlining those white parts with color to retain their shape. And now you can very clearly distinguish them from the yellow and reddish parts. I'm doing that again here with the fin. And you can also clearly see it here when I add the dark parts around the fins. That helps that fish pop against the background. It looks very defined now. Another type of edge is the soft edge. And that's easily created on wet paper, but you can also do it on dry paper like I'm doing here by adding a slight shadow to the bright white parts in the fish. Because you can see here that I'm softening the hard edge with a clean and damp paintbrush, just so the paint doesn't dry in that way and just so it melts into the white background. So now you can see we end up with a gradient that gets us from one color to the next without anyone noticing because it's so subtle. These two types are the ones that I use the most in my paintings and the soft edge is especially good to build realism because having just hard edges all over can quickly make any painting look very cartoony. That's why a good mix of both is a great strategy. Then there are two more edges we don't talk about very often. There's the found edge and the lost edge. And I'll use them sometimes when I want to melt a subject into a dark background, but there are other ways you can use them. So the found edge is a bit like a hard edge. It helps distinguish a subject from a background or a part from another part, but it's a little more subtle than what we did with the fish here. Although we could argue that this white part in the fish here has a found edge because the background is pretty light beneath it, but it still shows, it's still hard enough of an edge. Then the lost edge is just a blurry area between the subject and the background or between two parts where you can barely tell where one starts and where the other one ends. The area all around the eye could be labeled as a lost edge because it's very soft, but this part in particular is very distinct in the fish. So these two, the found and the lost edges, they're closely related to hard and soft edges they're a little more rarely talked about and there's something that I like to play with and even exaggerate a bit more in my own paintings 
because I think that when you focus on those, they can take a realistic painting to the next level even more by adding more creative interpretation into it, making it look looser and still realistic at the same time. Do you use edges in your paintings? Please let me know in the comments. And next, check out this video to learn how I use negative painting to paint complex landscapes without the headache. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.